Good morning, uh, hello, and welcome to the Inspired Business Leadership Q&A with Richard Gerber. Um, this is part of our Inspired Business podcast series, which we launched earlier this month. Um, Richard was our launch guest. Um, I'm Toby Bradford. Um, meeting with us today is Angela Tooley, our co-host, and of course, Richard Gerber, but I'll let them introduce themselves. Angela, would you like to say hello to people? Yeah, hi. Hi, yeah, Angela Tooley. Um, you probably heard my voice because I've been working with Toby on the Inspired podcast series. Um, I work for the University at uh, Derby Business School, um, leading on um, working with businesses under the, sort of the enterprise agenda. And Richard. Hello, everybody. I'm Richard Gerver. Um, I was the proud debutante on Inspire Business, uh, which was a thrill. Great to be involved and amazing, really, because we recorded it so long before the world changed as dramatically as it has. Um, it's great to be here. Um, some of you might know I'm, I'm uh, a very proud Derby, uh, University of Derby alumni. Um, in fact, I got my postgraduate in the university's first year of being a university in 1993. Um, I'm now honoured to be chairing the alumni and members board. Um, and uh, for my day job, when I'm not in lockdown, I'm a professional speaker and author and spent 20 years working on the front line of education as a teacher and head teacher. Right, I'm going to turn the, the big screen thing off now. Oh, what have I done now? There we go. Apologies if I seem mildly incompetent with this, but this is my first webinar. Hard to, hard to tell. I'm such a, such a smooth operator. Um, one of the reasons we, we decided to do this podcast was because, as Richard said, uh, we recorded the webinar, recorded the podcast before the coronavirus um, appeared. So we just wanted to bring forward some ideas and give people an opportunity to, to talk with us about leadership. Um, so if you have any questions on on leadership, please pop them into our question area. You will find that um, somewhere on your screens. Um, but we do have some questions for Richard already, in fact, um, which we'd like to kick off, kick off with. Um, so a lot of people are working from home now, Richard, and leadership is going to be a very different operation for them so how do you think people should approach that as leaders i think the really important thing for people right now is to remember that leadership has has first and foremost always been about um supporting and empowering people in your teams to do the things you need them to do you want them to do you expect them to do um, and I think right now, the greatest challenge of leadership is a human one. I think we have to make sure that it's not just about our people functioning, which is management really, but that given the extraordinary events we're living through, um, you know, that there has to be an appreciation that we're all gonna be coping and dealing and experiencing these events completely differently. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken to some people who will tell me, quietly and in whispers that actually they've enjoyed the kind of free range nature of of being at home and and uh, having a little more control over their lives spending more time with their families there are of course people that have lived through horrific situations some may have experienced bereavement some may be in environments where family members have uh, been in a state of upheaval because of a loss of job or whatever else the point is that we're living in times where the most important characteristic of leadership now right now is that human one it's that emotional connection emotional support and i think what we have to do because the danger is in in the climate we're in now a lot of people will kind of default to just trying to make everything as efficient as possible which i totally understand but actually the long-term legacy as leaders of how we deal with this is how we nurture and develop the relationships with our people yeah. over these months yeah that's interesting richard because obviously um alongside of the notes that I do, I do have a day job and I, I you know, I have a, a, a team of, of people who, um, you know, who I've had to support over this time. And that's 
you know, it, it's been interesting. It's been an interesting journey, and it's only sort of now when we have these conversations and I look back, you know, you you sort of see those various stages and things like that. And I agree at the start. Um, because I was having to deal with my own sorts of issues, I kind of just left them to sort of, you know, obviously I, I spoke to them and things like that, but I, you know, I just left them to sort of work out how to do things themselves, both as individuals and as a, as a team. And actually in hindsight, that was probably um, the best thing that I did because I didn't put any pressure on them. They all had to, as you said, they, they, they you know, I've got people who are living on their own in a flat and have seen anyone for eight you know eight ten weeks three to people who have a, a remote working sitting on camping chairs with young children running around and things I've had the whole spectrum so actually just allowing them to you know to work it through readjust readjust in terms of how they work together as a team has been you know it's really important and the, the communication um, point as well is, is interesting I think I have I found I've had to change the way I communicate with my staff. I've spent probably, um, you know, I'm very much a, you know, want to empower my team and, you know, you know, leave them to get on with things and sort of, sort of things like that. But actually, I felt I spent a lot more time um, communicating with them. Um, my staff's been very different. Um, you know, just sort of the things because you don't see people um as you would do in the office you kind of lose some of those sort of indicators that you would see sometimes in terms of their body language and just the sort of general their general sort of um sort of demeanor in the office and things like that so you know i've the things so for example i you know i'll quite often just say to someone um when i have like a call with them you know just ask those really simple questions like are you okay that i would never normally ask before, I've asked before because you'd have, you'd have sensed it but that sensing is gone so you know just sort of asking those sorts of questions different communication styles uh, and things like that uh, are some of the key things that I've learned over the last sort of 10 to 12 weeks. I think that's right and I, I think you know the, the, the really important thing is for us to be very mindful of kind of the five or six phases that most of us have gone through um, on a personal level, which will impact on the way we engage professionally as well as personally. You know, you you look at the kind of six phases that, that most people go through in any change process, but particularly when change is unexpected and imposed on them. And I, I wonder if this, you know, people or this will resonate with people because the first stage, and if we all cast our minds back two and a half months or whatever it is to the time we started to realize things were gonna change and change very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I, for one, and I'm sure most people start in a state of paralysis. You know, you kind of freeze, nothing really goes in. Um, some people in that paralysis state become really manic. It's like, I mean, I've seen, I saw people in the early days just going into some kind of crazy, delirious overdrive, trying to find a way to control the uncontrollable, right? And then what happens after that is, is people tended to go into a kind of denial phase. You know, you stick your head in the sand. Well, I'll just, it will be over in a week or two. We'll, we'll go back to normal or maybe it won't happen here or to my job or my company or my family. And then what we've seen over the last few weeks after that is a kind of anger right? People get angry and they look for who to blame. Who do I blame for this situation? And partly this is all because we, we feel this lack of control, which I think is the, I'll, I'll comment is the huge thing around the leadership challenge right now. On a personal and professional level, virtually all of us are experiencing or have experienced a, a profound sense of a lack of control. And so the anger generates. Then what happens in some is we kind of give up for a phase and we go you know what there's the anger all of it the denial none of it is going to give me back a sense of of control so i kind of go into a depression stage where everything becomes listless i'm not even sure i can be bothered to get dressed in the morning um I'm, I, you know i'm i'm done i'm just i'm just going to hibernate until there's a vaccine or something um and this is the point at which the leadership challenge clicks in because there are two phases after that, which I see as progressive and developmental, which are, are ways of helping people regain uh, a kind of semblance of feeling uh, of control. Um, and 
they start with a kind of exploratory phase, you know, and that's where people start to engage mildly by asking questions, by showing an interest. So what is this? What, what, what's going on? How is this going to impact my, what can I do in my business, my job or my personal life to try and negate or, or feel a level of control over this? And then finally, after that, you get to a kind of activation stage, an acceptance phase where everything settles down a bit and you start to just feel that you've got some control back of the parameters and variables that, that you're dealing with. Um, and I think in many ways, you're right, the real challenge is to assess in those snatch conversations and communications with your staff where you think you are, they are, sorry, on those kind of six phases of change and people will be at various points. And by the way, what's really interesting is after Boris Johnson, whenever it was two weeks ago, announced uh, the the Nando's scale, as I call it, you know, the, the five stages of hot yeah. to super cool and lime and whatever. Um, and, and he talked about this kind of, well, we're gonna have this phased release of lockdown. I noticed a number of people jump back from that kind of acceptance exploratory thing back into a more anxiety ridden thing, again, because it's a new parameter, a new mm -hmm. thing of change. So I think the really important thing as a leader is to say, how, how can I get my people into that more active, perceptive belief that they've got more control? How can I get them questioning? How can we get us looking forward and asking constructive and positive and insightful questions, which leads to communication and conversations? Because even if nothing comes of it, that process gives people a feeling of control which allows them emotionally to feel that they can engage again it yeah. this brings me back to one of the uh, the pull out things that you said within the podcast which was about leadership being empower about empowerment and about letting people off the leash and letting them run with stuff which seems in a in a situation where we're in, we're in lockdown um but what you're saying is to a degree to give people a feeling of control giving them that emotional empowerment and letting them run with stuff, giving them, okay, we want to, we want some parameters within which we can work, but we, we, we still need to be able to think about how we're going, where we're going and using our own initiative in a sense, which will give them control over their situation. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Angela. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, yeah, no, I absolutely relate to that. I mean, we had to, you know, my team, we were um, we were in a number of uh, business programs, um, very successful, uh, all face to face. Um, 16th of March, 17th of March, everything stopped. And literally we had to reinvent the whole the whole of our programs. And off the back of that, we had to change all of our processes and our measures and things like that. You know, but we you know, we've had to go through that sort of process of developing all of those. Um, but you know, so we, we kind of went, we kind of like went back into that sort of task, sort of very much focused task operational thing, because that was what we needed at the time for business survival, to be to be honest. Um, and that was, you know, that was a very tough time for the team. And I think one of the one of the biggest surprises that I had was, um, you know, I went from a a team that were high performing and a very close knit to almost we almost went back to day one in terms of that sort of team formation thing and we've we've had to spend a couple of months as we've gone through that process rebuilding re-engaging as a team thinking about how we we work together in this new environment where we're not all sitting together um, and i was quite surprised how um, that we we literally did go back to that sort of base point team formation sort of stage and things like that and it's, it's been amazing to see that, you know, that journey that you would normally take, you know, potentially weeks and months. It's happened in a really short period of time. And it's nice that now we're at the stage where, as you were, were just saying, we're, we're at that, you know, we're, we're back to that sort of high performing team. And we're starting to um, develop new ideas, their creativity is flowing. And, you know, we've over that, this last sort of 10 to 12 weeks, we you know, we've gone through that whole process and we've come back and, you know, we're actually, um, you know, really, really sort of focused on, well, actually, 
this wasn't that bad. And, you know, if we manage to do this, what else can we do? You know, and so, you know, I've just had a couple of meetings this morning about some great new ideas that the team have had. And we're just like, let's just do it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I, I think what you're saying is really important. And actually, despite all of the horror and, and, and the uncertainty and, you know, for some, the horrific um, lived experience they've been through over the last couple of months, if there is a glimmer of light, a legacy that's positive that we can take from this, it is actually that we are far more capable than we were led to believe we were mm -hmm. at dealing with change and innovation. Um, because you're right, you know, whether it's been in, a, in the academic capacity of a university, and Derby has always been well set up, for example, for online learning. But, you know, there's been huge procrastination for 10, 15, 20 years over what, how do we balance online learning? How do we create blended learning? How do we create you know, how do, what's the difference? The same with working from home and working in an office. And all of a sudden we were presented with a situation and what most organizations have accomplished in two and a half months is truly staggering. I mean, it is truly staggering. You know, most people would have had what they've achieved in the last two and a half months down as a tentative kind of five year plan. And I think what's really important about that is to understand that for so many years, the reason we kind of lack confidence in our own capacity is because we're almost trained and managed to believe in what I call the assumption of incompetence. So most organizations, and I think we talked about this, Toby, on the podcast, you know, we did. this idea that, that we're kind of mad, we, most traditional organizations are predicated on a belief that most people will only do their best work if they are hyper-managed to do it, whether it's through target setting or performance management strategies or whatever else it is. And as a result, people lose the confidence in themselves to take their own initiative and do innovative things, to set themselves challenging tasks, to risk making mistakes in them, and therefore evolving. But what you've, we've seen for a, lo a large, long time now, and in a, in, a, in a number of dynamic companies, is a different style of leadership and management, which is assumed excellence. And, and that's where the people in an organization are believed in, they're trusted, and that creates a different fabric of, of structure. You still manage, but you only manage at a point of inter intervention if people need it, rather than managing everybody to prove their competence. Yeah. Now, what's happened in the last two and a half months to an extent, because you don't have the physical environment where you can hyper-manage people, is far more people have been able to show their excellence and demonstrate that. And I think one of the really interesting challenges as we get back to, and I got oh, first first um, BS bingo word, if anyone's <laughs> playing that at home, because we can't see you, um, is the new normal, is one thing we mustn't do is let ourselves go back to believing that we need to go back to old management styles and go back to a management structure based on inco the assumption of incompetence and make sure that we respect and realize the capabilities of our teams and create that structure, which is much more around the celebration of excellence. Thanks, Richard. Um, one of the things you mentioned then uh, about flexibility and larger companies, um, just going back to the podcast, one thing we talked about was companies who have been working in a certain way for so long, the difficult idea of change for them. Um, this has been forced on us in a sense, and it just shows how, how much change is possible. Yeah, I mean, I, you're right. You know, again, it, it's no accident that most of the most innovative companies in the world are companies that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago, whether they're small companies or in particularly some of the large tech companies. You know, they're fleet footed. They don't have a tradition to deal with. Um, one of the things I remember, um, and we might have told this story, so for anyone who heard the podcast, forgive me. Um, one of the stories of I tell a lot is about the meeting I had with Eric Schmidt, who was the executive chairman of Google until a, a couple of years ago. And he said something to me then which, which really struck me because I, I asked him what his greatest challenge was in his time at Google. 
And he said, actually, my greatest challenge, Richard, has been our success. I mean, he wasn't in an, in on the very early days. That was Larry Page and Sergey Brin working on an ideological and visionary belief that doing something to the internet, you know, bringing democracy to the internet. But they brought Eric in to help monetize the business and turn it into an, a, a functioning organization. And he said, you know, when I first started, innovation was easy because we had nothing to lose. And so the meetings in teams were just so exciting and dynamic because everything was possible, because there was a very low threshold of, of uh, what could happen if this all goes wrong. Right. But he said the greatest challenge we've had has been the extraordinary accelerated rise of this business, because very, very quickly we had a whole lot to lose and we were answerable to a whole huge number of people, whether they were investors, directors, um, whether they were shareholders, whether they were staff members. Um, and he said, what was really interesting was we stopped discussing the art of the possible based on our founding vision and values. And, and I don't know how many people remember that the founding vision and values of Google were to organize the world's in information, make it accessible for everybody, and by so doing, diminish evil, right? That was the, how, how well they've done on that, we won't, we won't get into that today. But the point is that that's how Google Earth was created and Google Maps and all the other extraordinary things they did. But he said, over time, we became more and more obsessed with what other people in our sector were doing which meant we stopped believing in ourselves and our vision and, and our ability to meet and, and practice, uh, create pre practical solutions for our vision. And we started to obsess with what other people were doing. He said the meetings changed. Suddenly people were obsessed with what Apple were working on or what Microsoft or Facebook or, or one of these other organizations. He said, when I look back on our greatest disasters, they have all come when we've tried to react to what somebody else was doing. And I think the really important thing about that is the nature of companies and organizations, the bigger they become, the more successful, the more embedded they become, the more they have to lose, the more they lose the ability to be fleet footed, to take risk, to be innovative and creative. And it's why, actually, this has been an extraordinary two months, because the world has almost said to you, to every company, no matter how long it's been functioning, change. You've got to change. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I think will happen in this process is, is there will be companies that struggle, but I think some large organizations are really going to use this time to reevaluate and, and use it as an opportunity to recalibrate. I was talking to um, somebody the other day who works with a major global tire company, and she was telling me that the CEO of this company was now deciding whether they even needed office buildings anymore or whether they would get rid of liquidate their their office real estate and just keep their manufacturing plants open and find a more economical and agile way of keeping their office based staff working together in 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 different formats so those conversations are going on in real time just going back to the yeah. podcast it's interesting I sorry we're talking over each other yeah. before we I would never say, do this. Think, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I was going to say Preston, I've seen, um, obviously, you know, you sort of see, um, you know, sort of daily news stories that are coming out and things like that. And we've been chatting with the, the, the businesses who we work with regularly and things like that. And it's almost like the supply chain's turned on its head. And some of the best stories we've seen um, and examples I've seen over the last few months in terms of companies diversifying, companies um you know, finding innovative ways to continue to, you know, get people to work, um, operate and things like that have come from some of the smaller companies. And, and there's some really good lessons that some of the larger businesses could learn from, from those companies. And we're already starting to see that in terms of some of the larger businesses um, that we work with, starting to reach out and actually, you know, talk to their supply chain in a different way and want to engage with them um, in, you know, in terms of more, um, more innovate make, make you know innovation and collaboration and and make some of those processes uh, that are normally quite difficult in terms of um qualifying new ideas in a supply chain particularly if you think about some of the the big local supply chains we've got around ours like like aerospace and rail um 
actually trying to sort of work with them a lot earlier on so actually we can start getting some of this innovation quicker to market and things like that so i'm already starting to see that change in some of those key sectors um i've just had a message in um, from somebody saying uh, loving the webinar isn't recorded no we're we're flying on the seat of our pants here which is which is great fun um going back to what you said about google and uh, and looking inside your own industry one of the big takeaways we had from the podcast was was you should look outside look and that's where you find your flexibility you look to see what other people are doing but not necessarily people who are working in the same field look outside look at see how other people deal with stuff and new ideas will come in yeah i mean and that's really what angela was touching on and i think you know this is this is another incredible moment and i know you know i'm not trying to belittle the last two and a half months and the stress and pressure on anybody but there has been a weird kind of gift really which we've had which is for some people um, seconds have become minutes, minutes have become hours, hours have become days and days have become months, right? There's been a slowing of time, which we've never experienced in our lives before. And it's easy for me to say this, by the way, because my children are both grown up, so there's no homeschooling thing going on in my house. Um, <laughs> but but we will never have this time again, and we've never had it before. And it's an incredible opportunity to put your head above the parapet and see what other people are doing. Because most people's businesses function at warp speed. They function at capacity, where you are so busy doing the job you have to do day in, day out, that, that we don't have time to stick our heads above a parapet and see what others are up to in, in real functional terms. You know, there, there, are tr there are tremendous networks in Derby, including Marketing Derby and another um, no, no, uh, you know, number of other um, connective forums where people get to meet one another and kind of loosely talk a little bit and share practice, which I know people find phenomenally useful. But actually now is a wonderful time to dip out of your industry and your sector entirely and ask yourself, how are they doing that? What are they doing? What does the supply chain look like for, for that, that organization over there? Or how are they innovating? What does their online working pattern look like? Have they still got a staff development program? And, and what's, you know, what's that looking like? Um, so I think now is an incredible opportunity to do that. And I really urge people not to waste this, this time. Because what the one thing we know, and we've heard the, the expression a lot, and I don't think the champagne bottle's a great analogy, but but if and when the world opens up again properly, so post-vaccine, you know, and that some sort of champagne bottle is a boom and we're off, and that would be great if that's true, and the economy goes into this warp speed, overdrive, you know, whatever we want to call it, um, we're not going to have the time then to reflect and challenge our own practice and ways of working so we've got to do that now and the best way to do it toby you're right is is not just to hang out and talk to people who are doing what you do every day because that limits the opportunity for creative thought you know the the, the way you max out create creativity doesn't happen when you talk to the people who do the same thing as you day in day out because all you do is recycle old ideas and how many people who are wizened wise pros have said of their industry, oh, if I stand still long enough, I become an innovator every five to 10 years because everything gets recycled, right? And that's because if all you do is you use the remit of your own um, experience, you can't ever you can't ever stimulate that creative process. You know, when when do people have their most creative thoughts? Well, usually when they're out running or, you know, having a day off or sitting in the garden or, you know, in, in the most inconvenient mean, moments where you don't want to be thinking about work. That's where the creativity comes from. And it's because you're enjoying the stimulus of other stuff. So, yeah, I, I urge people to connect with people they may have never connected with before over the time we've got in this space, um, take a real interest in what other sectors and organizations are doing. Because the mistaken belief that you can only learn from the people in your sector is one that speaks to that very traditional kind of tailorist model of efficiency. This isn't about efficiency anymore. This isn't about becoming more efficient. This is about transformation. And that needs a different mindset. 
I, I just touch on your point about sort of reaching out and looking what other people are doing and I think we have a unique opportunity at this moment because everyone is in the same position and actually we I have never had such close access to senior executives in in large corporations and government officials and things like that than I have now. So, for example, I quite often listen to the, the CBI daily webinars, um, not normally live, uh, normally sort of, you know, late at night when I'm switching off and things like that. But, you know, there's the opportunity on there to engage with and listen to, you know, senior executives from the likes of Kingfisher and Airbus and Tesco's and things like that. And never before do you have that accessibility where you can, you know, jump onto a webinar, you know, for an hour and, you know, put, get, you know, ask a question of, you know, you know, Chief Executive Kingfisher about what they're doing and their experiences and things like that so i think you know we need to take advantage of the opportunities while they're here because at some point these guys will stop doing these things and they'll you know they will become more busy and whatever else yeah talking absolutely. of questions talking of questions um there is a question field if people do have any questions to ask angela and richard um please um input some questions in there we also have uh, some questions that have been sent in elsewhere which I will put to Richard and Angela. One of these is, how can we adapt leadership styles to facil facilitate working in the new norm? Which is obviously one of those BS um, phrases. But so yeah. adapting a style of leadership, what do we do? Well, I think the first thing is, is we have to really spend a little time reflecting on what we mean by leadership. Because in many ways for me, in the most simple terms, management is about compliance. Now that's not, I'm not using that as a dirty word or dirty term, but management is about compliance. It's making sure that people are doing what they're paid to do in the way they're being asked to do it, right? And we use all of the, the, the different tools at our disposal to do that. Leadership for me, I've always believed on a really soft woolly phrase for me leadership is about serving the people who work with you and for you and actually leadership is about getting the best out of people it's about helping them understand realize and activate their potential it's giving them the courage and confidence to do that it's giving them opportunities and pathways they might not necessarily have seen before and it really goes back very much to to the start of our conversation which is this difference between control and empowerment so in many ways, we spend too much time assuming incompetence and therefore hyper-controlling staff. But what we need to do is shift our mindset and believe that the people who work who are working with us and for us are highly talented, highly committed, um, and want to do the best they can do. And therefore, well, we, should, we should be doing that anyway. Shouldn't we be doing that anyway? Yeah, we should. We should. But I, I guess what I'm saying, Toby, is I'm not sure we are, if we're honest, right. because we're under so much intense pressure to be productive so much of the time. And as a boss, you feel that for, for all of the, the responsibilities, economic and social that you, you carry, that we tend, particularly in, in times of stress and trouble, we tend to default to lowest common dom denominator, shut up, get our heads down, let's get it done. Right. And actually, what we need to do in times of trouble is trust and rely on the people who work with us more. And the thing is, it's not some drastic trance. You know, it's like a, a ta-da moment. Like, um, you know, you're going to come in on Monday to your to your next Zoom meeting or whatever, and go, "I'm changing my leadership style. <laughs> um, I'm going to be, you know, softer with you all. I've put an apple in the post to everybody. You know, it, it, it's slow and it's incremental. And the thing about leadership is, it's about it engendering trust." Um, and trust doesn't happen quickly. So it's about really focusing on those human relationships. And the other thing is, I think people will have adapted their leadership, as Angela said, you know, people will have adapted their leadership style more over the last couple of months than they even realize. Because that investment in human concern and trying to understand the person behind the job role is gonna pay dividends moving forward. And I think the challenge for leaders is not necessarily to do something dramatically new, but to realize the way they've led and managed over the last couple of months on a very human level is absolutely the best way to do it moving forwards. Yeah, I mean, you, 
by the nature of the fact that we're all working from home, I, I, I you know, I have got a lot closer to my team. Um, I've been forced to, um, and you know, that, that there's that uncomfortable moment at the, you know, at the start of this, where suddenly, you know, your professional and your your work boundaries have blurred, and that's been very difficult for people because, you know, normally, you know, you you. you you drop the kids at school, you kick the dog, you know, whatever else you do in the morning, you drive to work, you change and you switch from that, you know, being a mom, being a wife, you know, being whatever into and going to work and you kind of sort of have that space to leave that behind. And actually working in, in the same environment where the rest of your family are and where you live and things like that, it's, it's, it's quite it's been quite difficult to people because you do feel quite exposed because people say, what's happening behind the scenes you know I've had I've had to stop meetings because you know the dogs the pencil sharpener or the kids have been fighting and things you know and I'm just like don't don't worry about it guys you know what this is you know uh, this is completely uh you know how how it's going to be so I, I'm not bothered so don't you worry about it but people do worry about that exposure and things like that and so we've had to go through that process I think I've. Um, I think the one thing that I've probably on reflection, um, I've become a better, a better listener, um, and I think sort of I've spent a lot more time um, sort of sitting and listening to what my team are doing, and you know almost sort of sitting in the background when when there's team meetings and actually say look you know to, to sort of one of my project managers you take the lead and I'll just sit back and I'll just listen and just try and understand the general feeling of the team and what you're doing and things like that and that's really helped me think about what I need to do to better support the team going forward that's got a time for reflection and listening uh, we, we've are uh, getting some questions in sorry about scratching my head um, one for Richard. What are your thoughts about managing mental health and well-being of remote teams? Wow. I mean, this is this is a huge, a huge, huge issue, and we've kind of touched on it at, at various points. Um, I think there are a number of things here. I think you know, going back to looking for the signposts I talked about earlier in the six points, the six places people might be. I think one of the things we have to understand as managers and leaders is we can't be superhuman, right? And we can't necessarily um, be expected to do all this stuff ourselves because our name's on the door or on the letterhead or at the top of the website. Um, we also have to reflect that we ourselves are more vulnerable than probably we've ever been before and we are dealing with more than we've ever been before and just because you're a leader or manager doesn't mean you're more resilient more mentally tough you know all that that kind of old school machismo has has got to go but i think what is important as a leader and manager is to be cognizant you know you know your people almost as well as you know your family particularly if you're line managing smaller groups or if you're in a smaller company and so you can see the subtle change if somebody starts to cause concern. Their behaviors come across as, as different. And I think what you need to be able to do is do a bit of research to know where to signpost those people. You have to be able to support them by signposting them to the right places and the right expertise and telling them that it's OK. You know, again, I think the biggest the biggest thing we've done for mental health over the last decade is is start to remove and i say start because i think there's still a long way to go start to remove the taboo the fact that it is about if if you're stressed or you're you know mentally going through some difficult times or you know you're depressed or whatever that somehow that's a sign of weakness or incompetence that that machismo guff is going and, and we have to push it further out the door. And I think the first thing you can do as a leader is make sure your staff feel comfortable and confident um, talking to you and being honest and being vulnerable. And the best way, by the way, you get them to do that is by you being honest and you being vulnerable and not being some kind of on a pedestal Churchillian, Churchillian figure. You know, if you look, and I'm not going to get political heavily here, but if you look at probably the moment at which people had the greatest empathy for Boris Johnson in the last couple of months, it was when he was going through the horrific 
health scare he had with COVID and people developed a, a much stronger empathy towards him. Um, so I think being vulnerable yourself is really important, but also realizing you are not superwoman or superman. It is not your job to keep that person on the right track. It's to ensure that you help them find that right track. All you can do is create a culture where they're prepared to be honest and vulnerable. Yeah, no, I'd absolutely agree. I mean, we've, you, you know, I mean, one of the first things that we did was just make sure that everyone had, you know, had some basic things. So that's sort of, you know, have you got the tools to do the job and things like that? Um, you know, so some practical things about, you know, if you've got a working laptop, if you've got somewhere to sit that's comfortable. I've had so many, you know, sort of team members with bad backs over the last few weeks because they're sitting on various sorts of dining chairs, camping chairs and things like that, making sure people, you know, people are stressing about the fact that their broadband's not working and they can't connect. So we've had to go through a lot of those sorts of operational things. And I know obviously, you know, they're some of the biggest stresses when, you know, on a basic level, I can't dial into a meeting because my broadband's, you know, dropping out and things like that. So we've done some of those sorts of things very quickly. Uh, we've also sort of set up a buddy system with ours, so each, so everyone in the team has a buddy. And initially, I, I set it up because of, I was concerned that I was going to have a lot of staff members off sick. Thankfully, that hasn't happened. But it means that everyone's got someone who they talk to on a daily basis, who they have a chit chat with, who they can support, you know, support each other, and things like that. We have virtual coffee mornings because what I found is, is that. Meetings, we, we use Microsoft Teams all the time for meetings, but meetings are very operational focused, they're very task focused because actually, um, you know, no one wants to spend all day sitting on a, on a computer and things like that. But by, by being like that, you lo you're losing some of that creativity and that spontaneity. So, you know, by putting in, we have sort of daily coffee mornings, and we literally we just say, like, if anyone wants to dial in, we'll all sit and have a chit chat. And that's been good because it's enabled people just to talk informally like they would do within the office. But it's also, you know, as we switch off, we thought we'd start chatting about the things that we'd like to do and things like that. And that started to sort of create those little sparks of magic back into the team and things like that. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, you know, I am spending a lot more time um, talking to the team, listening to the team um, and, and things like that and just sort of making sure that they are OK, because I am recognising that you know, we're not at the end of this every day. Some, you know, every day or every week, things are changing. So, you know, we think we're on a level playing field and then, you know, there's a new announcement about what the next phase looks like or there's a, you know, or, you know, I've got I've got staff members who've got partners on who are alert who who don't know if they've got a job you know so you know all these things are happening behind the scenes so you know we just need to understand that everyone is is dealing with it differently um everyone is adapting differently and also for each individual person there are different points where there are different and new stresses coming into that situation uh, that we have to be mindful of and 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 sort of support them with and things like that and and help them deal with and signposts. Thanks, Angela. Um, another question's come in and it sort of relates to what we've been talking about. But um, and my thoughts are a lot of the the skills we're talking about, the leadership skills we're talking about, are skills that we use on a on a day to day basis, whatever scenario scenario we're in. But the question is, do you think leading from a distance requires new skills and or perhaps a greater emphasis on certain leadership skills we already have? That's, um, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know that I have a, a concrete answer to that. But I think what Angela said earlier is probably the most significant thing of all which is we have to hone our ability to listen. Um, we have to listen more right now for a whole host of reasons. You know, when you think about the way you process what you see in your daily life as a leader, um, so much of that is based on visual in, uh, information, on body language, on the way somebody might be speaking to you, tonally observing the way they're working. Um, and, and a lot of those things, if you like, have gone, we've taken, we've had to take the three dimensional glasses off, right? And now we're in two dimensions. 
and I, and I think that ability to listen right now to the nuance and tone, to the phrasing, to what it is people are saying to you, I think has become more profound and, and more important than than ever. So I would suggest that uh, I would suggest that it has to be listening. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I yes, as I said, I think this is the one thing that I, you know, I recognise that I've probably been, you know, become better at over the last over the last few weeks, and and you know, really list, you know, active listening, not just you know, sort of, um, you know, nodding your head and saying and things like that. I think trust has been absolutely key, um, and I. I don't know whether I've done it deliberately or not, but I have taken almost a second step back and I, I have a lot more um, relaxed approach with my team. It's interesting, I, I, I've also had that in my personal life as well and I'm sure if the kids came into the room they would say the same as well. But that sort of, you know what, just I trust you just to do the right thing because you, you know, we're all in this together, you, you know, you want this as much as I do. I'll just leave you to get on with it and work out how the best way it is for you and your colleagues to to deal with this and and you know come up with the right solution that we you know that's that you know that's right for everyone that that hits the shared goals and targets that we that we have been collectively set. So um, that's been interesting as well. So that, that goes back to, to trust. I think, and I, just to pick up on that, sorry, Toby, I think Imagine. that trust's really important because I think the other important thing to recognize about leadership is to have the confidence to be collegiate about it. You know, in a time of profound change and uncertainty, there may be other people better placed than you to come up to generate ideas and thinking and working, working uh, ways of working um, in your organization. And so it's to have the confidence and trust to be to allow others to lead, to step back and uh, allow others to lead. You know, one of the things I think I've seen in the, the leaders I've ever interviewed is that incredible confidence and tr trust in their people, but confidence in themselves to be allow that to allow themselves to step back and let others take the lead where it matters because we're in an entirely new world now and although you may be the founder leader or or been in that the industry or sector you you've been in all of your life or trained in it or whatever you know from apprenticeship or university or whatever it is highly likely there will be people who are far more skilled at certain things than you are. You know, I think about remote learning, for example, um, and I look at my two grown up children. I mean, I have spent two months and an absolute fortune trying to work out how to be a professional speaker from home, hence the Ponzi backdrop. But my children have like gone, oh, yeah, dad, if you'd asked me, I would have been able to do that for you in five minutes <laughs> and for no money. Um, so yeah, that's it. I think sometimes we have to understand that the experts aren't necessarily the ones we expect them to be. And look, and taking, a positive view, true. taking a positive view of what we're talking about here is the opportunity um, to use the developed skills, the skills we already had, the listening skills and the, and the trust skills, and the empowerment skills we already had, that perhaps are being given the opportunity to, to develop a lot more in this situation the opportunity once we come out of this situation to keep that going yeah no i agree I, I this is one of the things i think we need to be very clear about now is not so much an exit strategy because we don't know when that exit's coming but i think now's a great time to really be reflecting on what we as individual managers and leaders have learnt both about ourselves and about our teams over the last two months and, and for what could be months more. Um, and to make sure that those things are explicit in, in what we know and what we understand, even if it's to the point where people journal, you know, they have an idea, they see something happen, there's something they've seen in, in a member or, or, or an interaction in their team, they journal it, log it, because what you don't want is just, to kind of see it in the moment and then not learn from it. And, and we've got an incredible opportunity to reflect and learn now. And, and hopefully as this dissipates, because I think it's gonna be that much more graduated process, as we go back to some semblance 
of the physical environment we were we were in before the business environment we were in before i think making sure that we've learned from this experience taken the really good stuff and used it as part of our policy driving forward around leadership and management means that although this this couple of months this few months is going to be horrendous for a lot of people and a lot of businesses it'll hopefully give us something positive and constructive as a legacy to move forward with it's interesting that you've used the l word richard obviously learn because um without doubt everyone has learned something new over the last three months because they've been forced to you know i mean i i am by no means a dinosaur but i'm pretty close to it when it comes to digital capability you know and ev everyone has learned something and actually what organizations and and teams and leaders need to do is 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 capture that you know we've all been forced into you know doing things differently um adapting to new things embracing new technology and things like that and we always need to use that as a platform to 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 sort of continue to develop that learning culture and drive that sort of process uh, improvement and behavior changes in organizations and use it as that basis to sort of drive you know drive real change and you know different practices and things like that and i've read quite a lot of articles recently about you know this time being the time for companies to sort of um you know and start to embed a new learning culture within their organizations whatever that may mean uh, on different levels doesn't necessarily mean you know new new hard skills new digital skills and things like that it, it, you know it's also about behavioral changes and just sort of you know perhaps thinking more entrepreneurial and you know sort of in terms of the way that you work um you know and sort of you know we've talked about agility and things like that and it's those sorts of softer skills that we just need to sort of you know encourage more businesses be braver you know take you know take calculated risks and things like that going forward because look what you've achieved in the last three months you know I mean, I think you're right. I think there are, you know, there are there are two words really for me moving forwards that companies need to really comprehend now in practical terms. One is agility, and the app, the other is collaboration. You know, we need to be far more collaborative, collegiate, and we need to be far more agile. And we've proved that we can do both in the last two and a half months. We've got another question that's come in. Um... Do you have any advice as to how you can best manage productivity with remote workers, which is kind of a different way of coming at it? Yeah, I mean, I I think, again, that the, the important thing there is to to challenge our traditional sense of what it means to have a productive workforce, you know, because one of the things I, I, I personally have experienced, you know, I've been working from home since I left my headship 13 years ago. Um, and what I've learned is that the biorhythm of my day is not necessarily traditional anymore. So I don't, I haven't worked from nine to five, if you like, or eight till four or whatever else it is um, in 13 years. And what I've learned over that 13 years is there are times in the day where I can accomplish as much in an hour as I used to accomplish in four in a workplace because all the factors around me. And I think one of the really important things around productivity that we need to learn is two things, really. One, it's not necessarily about how many hours you put in. You know, that myth that, well, I look how productive I'm being. I worked uh, nine days last week. You know, that's it's a myth. Um, as is multitasking, by the way. There's no evidence anywhere to say multitasking works. And I'm sorry, I know I'm defending that thesis as a man, and there may I be wasn't people out there anything. who might be going, no, you're wrong. Um, but but this whole idea that productivity is about how many hours you put in, and those hours have to be between fixed states and times in a day. You know, what people will have learned, I think, over the last two and a half months of working at home is they will have learned more about their own biorhythm. Uh, biorhythms and patterns and they will have adapted and adopted their days where they have control over it children permitting um 
to work hours when they know they're at their most productive. So for example, I know some people get up in the morning, go for a run, get to their get to their screen or wherever they're working at 7, 7.30 in the morning, and by lunchtime, they've accomplished more than they'd accomplish in a full day normally, easy. And I think we have to be more flexible. We have to question, ask questions and observe and say, okay, when are people, individuals at their most productive? And if, if there's flexibility, we need them to allow to allow them to be that. You know, we've known for years, for example, around teenagers and education and learning that teenagers do not work best between nine o'clock in the morning and 3.30 in the afternoon. Teenagers scientifically are at their most productive in the mid to late evening, right? So there's a real question there about why we structure what we do the way we do. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to explore productivity in a different way. Uh, yeah, absolutely agree. And, you know, I've got I've got team members now who are working all sorts of weird and wonderful work patterns and things like that. Um, I, you know, I myself, I quite often, I'm sitting in a fairly darkened room at the moment, I quite often sort of have an hour off sort of mid-afternoon, spend time with the kids, go for a walk, go for a bike ride, switch off, and then go back to it later and catch up with the day and things like that. I think the one, the one uh, area of caution that I do have is that because work and home is blurred, I'm very mindful with my team that, that, you know, I'm very clear, there isn't an expectation that you work 24 seven. And actually, yes, yes, it is very easy at the moment for you to, you know, go on, log on at night and check emails and things like that. But, you know, I don't expect that. And actually, if, if that's when you want to do it, then please take some time off during the day when the kids want to do something with you, or you want to go for a run or whatever you want to do. You know, so actually, we go back to this trust thing again, is that it's, you know, it's about being supportive of people wanting, wanting to manage and, you know, working, you know, deciding how they work best and things like that, but also to en ensure that they do have that, that the correct work-life balance. And I know at the moment for some that is very challenging because they're either working or, they or they're looking after children because schools aren't open and things like that, but hopefully as schools start going back, they can better adapt to those sorts of routines and also allow themselves some proper downtime and some proper uh, quality sort of family time and things like that. Uh, because that, you know, that at the moment I know isn't happening with some of my team because, because of the other pressures that they've got. Right, well, we said we we're going to give ourselves an hour on this webinar. We're, we're approaching that now. I just wanted to give both of you an opportunity to leave our viewers with a pearl of wisdom let's say is there any one thing that you think is the most important to consider in this situation for me i think the most important there are so many and you've you've kind of put me on the spot but i think the most important thing to to take from this situation is the ability to reflect um, to take time, because often we see time as the enemy of productivity. We see time as the enemy of accomplishing what needs to be accomplished. And I think what we need to understand is time is probably the most important resource you have in your organization. And that's not more time to do. It's time to reflect. It's time to step back. You know, for leaders and managers, it's time to go and have a cup of coffee with somebody in a totally different world who doesn't necessarily connect directly to what you're dealing with in the moment. And I think if what we do is we start to see time as a commodity that needs to be protected and utilized in a different kind of way, that will give us a really strong way of being able to carry some of the good things that have come out of the last two and a half months forwards as we move into the next phase of hectic. And the reason I say that is I remember, um, you know, at, at when the financial crisis happened 2007, loads of people started to see their work pattern change. They were going to commit to doing things differently. Leaders were going to do things differently. The way they were going to construct the, pur the purpose around their organizations were going to change. And everybody did for about 18 months. And then the milk and honey started to flow again, and everyone went back to their default setting. So I think in this case, the most important thing is to capture the stuff that's worked for you. Do not lose it and make sure you keep time constantly 
to reflect and think and network uh, and, and and to use those soft ideas because actually I think what we've realized is those soft ideas have become the hard currency. Angela. This is an interesting one. So, so a couple of weeks ago when I was just, we were just having dinner, um, we started chatting about what we missed the most during lockdown and things like that. And I, I, I said one word, I said spontaneity. And, and I still hold to that. It's the one thing that I miss more than anything else. And I think that's both in, in, in work and socially. And just this is where you get the enjoyment and the pleasure in life and and it's where you get the magic Can we and i don't think it was your podcast richard but on one of the podcasts we did talk about business magic but but you know in business it's where you get that magic that sort of you know casually bumping into someone as you're walking around the office or something like that and having a chat with them leads to you know new ideas and things like that that sort of spontaneity of you know or oh, just it was a nice day let's go for a walk let's drop into the pub you know it's those sorts of spontaneous moments that that make make life special and, and work special and things like that and so my advice is try and find a way to bring spontaneity back into your life again um even under the current circumstances thank you very much well i'd like to thank again richard gerver and angela Tooley for doing this webinar with me today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and I hope that you have found it very useful. Now again the webinar was based on our Inspired Business podcast which endeavours to bring you engaging and inspiring stories from across the business landscape in Derby, Derbyshire and beyond. Um, thank you for listening today. You can find our Inspired Business podcast at derby.ac.uk forward slash inspired business. Um, we've had two episodes broadcast so far and more episodes will be coming over the next few weeks. Well, thank you again, Richard, and thank you again, Angela. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye, folks. Bye.